This is a Corn Cherry Lite Split Keyboard that we'll be assembling today. And it is a bundle set I've ordered from Yusha Kubo, a workshop that specializes in making keyboard kits here in Japan. Included in this bundle are a bunch of stuff that we'll be talking in just a second. However, the only remaining parts that you would need to consider are the key switches as well as the keycaps to complete this entire build. You also need a TRS to TRS jack to connect both the left hand side to your right hand side keyboard. In this video, I'll try to provide a breakdown from start to finish on how you can put together your own split keyboard by yourself, including flashing a default key map with zero coding knowledge. And here are all the tools that you will need for this DIY project. A sharp tip cutter, a soldering iron and solder, a multi screwdriver with a small cross diameter, some tape and a Windows machine for flashing the firmware onto your keyboard. With it out of the way, Let's start building this thing. Starting out with the printed circuit board of the Corn Cherry V1. And this is the bottom acrylic plate for both the left and right keyboard. Then we have the top plate that houses all the key switches, which we'll be installing it later. In this small package, we have two acrylic plates for your OLED module, a bunch of screws and spacers to assemble your keyboards, and two micro USB 80 Mega 32U4 controllers with pin heads, one for the left and the other for the right keyboard. Then we also have the two OLED display modules for each controller, along with some pin socket and pin headers. Apart from that, we also have two TRRS jack and two reset switch, one for each side. Lastly, we have a big row of diodes that will be required to be soldered onto the PCB later. And that's basically all the things that comes packaged in the bundle. There is a full document from Full Stun or Full Stand posted on GitHub on the step by steps of putting the corn keyboard together. Links will be included in the description box down below. So be sure to check it out before beginning your DIY project. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get building. The first thing that we'll be doing is soldering all the true hole diodes onto the PCB. It is a tedious job as you would need to bend the legs of the diodes as such and carefully align the correct orientation when inserting the diodes into the PCB. As you can see, the diode has a symbol that shows which direction the diode is to be mounted on. Take note that the darker part of the diode follows the direction of where the arrow is pointing. The upper side of the PCB is the side with the diode symbol showing on that surface. So we'll begin with putting the diode through the PCB and the diode legs comes out on the other side and it can be opened up like such to keep it secure. There are approximately 21 pieces of diode on each side of the keyboard so do take your time. The diode should not wiggle that much as the legs coming out from behind the PCB should hold the diodes in place even without any soldering. So a quick tip on bending the diode's leg can be done using this simple trick. Hold the diode right in the middle and with your finger, simply flick downwards and it should get a pretty decent shape with the bending. Do it on the other side and now do it for another 40 pieces and it should be good to go. Now after inserting all the diodes from the left keyboard to the right keyboard, we can go on to the next step. After you have placed the diodes through the via hole, it should look something like this. Well, before we start soldering, I will be applying a layer of tape to further secure the diodes in place and then we'll be ready to start soldering. So each diode has two legs and you will need to use a soldering iron with some solder to fill up the via holes near the diodes. Simply heat up the soldering iron to about 300 degrees Celsius, place the solder near to the soldering iron and as it starts to melt, you can begin filling up the hole where the diode legs are protruding from the via hole onto the PCB. A clear illustration would be something like this and the end results should look something like this. Once you have confirmed that all the via holes are soldered, then you may proceed to remove the tape and check it one more time would need to do this for both the left and right side of the keyboard. Next, we will mount the TRRS jack and the reset switch and the 4-pin socket for the OLED display module. So carefully place the reset switch into the socket in the center of the keyboard like such. The TRRS jack sits slightly below the reset switch. Do take note that the TRS jack should face outwards on both sides of the keyboard like such. The 4-pin socket then sits slightly on top of the TRRS jack. Once everything is in place, secure the parts with tape once again and then we can flip around and begin soldering the via holes. 
Once done, you can remove the tape and have a quick look to see if all the parts are fully secure. Repeat this for the other side and now both sides should look almost identical except the parts are mirrored. Again, the left TRS jack should have the jack facing outwards, similarly to the right hand jack. We can then start to trim off the legs of the diet with a sharp cutter. Carefully cut the excess legs one by one. And oh, if you want to cut the PCB boards in the beginning as well, you may do so. I keep it intact with the PCB board for the ease of recognizing between the left and right of the keyboard. Once you have successfully cut everything that is about 80 diode legs and corners of the PCB for both keyboards, we can then proceed to our next step that is the microcontrollers and the older display modules. Starting with the microcontroller, do take note that the controller that came with the bundle set was a controller that was using micro USB, which I didn't really like. I picked up a controller with the same chip but with a type C connector and I decided to go with that because the pin layouts are exactly the same. So starting off with soldering the pin legs onto the microcontroller's via hole like such. Do take note to reduce the temperature settings on the solder when soldering near the microcontroller to around 270 degrees Celsius this time. Do it for both devices and you should be able to insert the controller onto the PCB with no problem. Do take note that I did not solder the microcontroller permanently onto the PCB as so I might swap out the microcontroller for a Bluetooth compatible one and I wanted to save time desoldering both the controllers of the PCB. So if you don't intend to swap out your controllers, do consider soldering them on directly onto the PCB. For future proofing, I'm using it just with the pins removable as such, and it is highly not recommended, but you can decide it for yourself. Then we will solder the OLED display modules with the male connector pins for both sides, and in the end, you should be able to slot it in onto the PCB. Next, we will begin to assemble the second most tedious thing to do, which is to install all of the key switches on top of the top plate for both sides of the keyboard. The switches that I decided to go with is the Gatoron Yellow Pro switches, as they were the best switches that I've used so far, previously inherited from the Epo Maker TH80 keyboard. Carefully insert all the key switches in place, and once done, it should look something like this. Repeat this for the other side. The next step is to place the top plate onto the PCB, and this has to be done very carefully as the pins on the key switches on the bottom side do tend to bend if you don't insert it firmly, so beware of that. Next, begin soldering the key switches onto the PCB for both sides of the keyboard like such. If you want a hot swappable key switches, you would need to look at the Corn Cherry V2 or V3 as you can solder hot swappable switches for future proofing, being able to swap out key switches from time to time. So once you have soldered up all the switches for both sides, and the end result should look something like this. So good job if you have followed along this far. The next few steps are simply assembling the rest of the keyboard. Now, the next part is where I wish I had knew earlier before assembling this entire keyboard. I wanted to test out to see if I made any mistakes with my soldering. And the method that was provided in the guide about shorting the ground pin with the controller didn't seem to work for me. And I was curious to see if the keyboard would function correctly. So the next part, we will test out a default firmware version from a software called QMK. Head to your computer, preferably a Windows machine. Download the QMKToolbox.exe from GitHub. Look for the latest release, download and install the application. Next, fire up QMK Toolbox and you'll be greeted with a black terminal like such. With a wire cable, depending on your controller port, connect your controller to your PC. You should get a notification that a device is connected like such. A COM port will appear on the bottom right corner. If I'm not mistaken, there will be a notification that will pop up. So the controller that you have right now does not have any firmware of any key mappings. So you would need to at least quickly flash a firmware onto the controller to start using it as a keyboard. So before flashing any firmware, Google up QMK configurator, search for CRKBD, which stands for Corn Keyboard slash revision one in the first drop down section under keyboard. As you click it, you should see the key map layout changing into a layout that looks similar to the one that we are building. Head over to compile and wait for the build to be done. Next, hit firmware to download your .hex file, which will be used to flash your key map settings onto your controller. I'll also leave the default .hex file link in the description box down below for ease of reference. Next, back to the QMK toolbox.exe, toggle on auto flash option right here. 
before we begin flashing, be sure that the TRS jack is not plugged in from your left keyboard to your right keyboard. So we will begin flashing with the left side of the keyboard. Hit the reset switch twice to enter firmware writing DFU mode. And if all goes well, you will see the terminal launching to write the firmware onto the controller. This process should take around 5 to 10 seconds. After completed, you should be able to see from the long that it is successfully updated. Now repeat the same for your right keyboard and be sure that your TRS jack is still not connected. Remove the USB cable from your left keyboard. Now insert it to your right keyboard and start flashing your right hand side keyboard. After both the keyboard has the firmware, you are done. Once again, remove your USB cable from your right keyboard. Now plug it into your left keyboard as the left keyboard will always be the master device and your right hand side keyboard will be the slave. Now you can connect your TRS jack from your left keyboard to your right keyboard and you should be able to start checking the keyboard if all of the keys are actually working. Open up notepad and check every single key to see if they are actually working. And you should have a functioning keyboard indicating your soldering skills have passed the test. I personally have not faced any troubles so if you have some key presses that are not recognized, be sure to check again your connections and soldering and slowly troubleshoot it that way. So guys, one thing I forgot to mention in this video is putting on the keycaps, which I went with the MX Double Shot PBT keycaps from Epo Maker. I would recommend looking for a 40% layout keycap because you are only looking at keycaps that can fit within this keyboard. That being said, this can be done after you have flashed a default key mapping on your keyboard or before, but doing it after makes more sense in case you have some problems with your soldering. You don't have to remove all of your keycaps and put them back together. Then we'll move on to the rest of the keyboard assembly. Now that both the keyboards are tested to be working well, we can assemble the bottom acrylic plate for the corn keyboard. Next, you'll need to use the spacers and screws that were provided in the bundle. The spacer has both female ends that takes in male screws on both ends. Align the plates together and screw them on tight. There should be five screws on both sides, so be sure to start from the top side, moving down to the bottom side, finishing off with the acrylic plates on the bottom side. Lastly, attach on the rubber feet on all four corners so that your keyboard doesn't slide on your desk. And with that, you have completed building a corn keyboard all by yourself. Be sure to play around with different key mapping layout to take full advantage of the QMP software for creating your own customized key map to suit your preferences. I have a lot more to share on my keyboard journey with you guys, which I will be posting some updates in the near future. That being said, that is all from me in this video. I hope you have found this video insightful. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment down below. I'll be sure to get back to you guys as soon as possible. Thank you all so so much for tuning in. My name is Ken and I'll catch you all in the next video. Stay safe, peace out. Bye-bye.